Thank you, everyone, for coming. And it's kind of working and kind of not, so I'll talk loud and enunciate even more. Again, welcome to this presentation. Um, just a quick three thank yous. Joe Holstein, Nikki Warden, and Peter Gardio for setting all this up. Having everybody come. Patty Cranes and Chad doing some of the IT work and helping get everything set up. This is not an easy thing to put together. Um, and I'm so delighted at the turnout. It's going to be an amazing afternoon of conversation and remembrance. I'm looking forward to the turn of the Thank you all for being here. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I went out to Hong Kong in January 1979 to cover southern China. Uh, I was only 16 years of age. So <laughs> I, I go back so far that I knew Jerry Cohen in Hong Kong, and then later in Beijing, that's how I was called back. I go. So all of you aside, we're here for uh, a very timely, actually a more timely conversation about China and about America's relationship with it, uh, and, and it's all the news that the trade war is imminent, according to some accounts. So our, our, uh, our timing today is uh, impeccable. So also I'd like to thank uh, Jerry Cohen and his law center at NYU, uh, and Annie Nathan from Columbia at Weatherhead Institute, and also uh, Susan Jakes from uh, the China file at the Center for Chinese Studies, I think so. We're so, so sorry for the show can't be here with us today. So, um, with no further ado, Susan, why don't you take it away? First panel is about uh, correspondence and cover the event. Uh, and then, one of my most important announcements is that you see the uh, Twitter handle on your program. Those of you who are on Twitter, tweet about this event today. Please do so to help us buy a mind share. And then the second household, household event, housekeeping event, is we're ending here at, at, at 1.45 in an hour. And then we're, we're all progressing upstairs. So this is going to be a complex movement of people upstairs. So please move uh, move as fast as you can because we're going to be starting with video upstairs. The room will be dark. So uh, no further ado, Susan and, and Hamlet, please. I'm on the panel. Yeah, I am. Hi. 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 About China, the China file, which is published by the Asian Society's Underground Western Media. Yeah. 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 Uh, this is a panel about covering uh, Tiananmen, by, the coverage of Tiananmen by foreign correspondents, and I am actually the only person on this panel who did not cover Tiananmen. Uh, and we have five really outstanding panelists, so I'm going to keep my comments extremely, extremely brief. Um, we thought that since this is the first panel in a jam-packed uh, day of jam-packed panels, we would just sort of start with some scene setting. And so I've asked each of the panelists to pick uh, one moment, one image that stands out for them from their time uh, covering the events of the spring of 1989 and to describe it vividly and briefly so that we begin the day with a, a kind of montage uh, and then we can 
dig in a little bit. Um, so we're going to start uh, two people to my left uh, with Dinda Elliott, who was covering uh, China for Newsweek magazine in the 80s. Um, and whose coverage of the core part of the story of the Beijing Spring uh, spanned the period, if you don't include what came before, uh, between the death of Hu Yaobang on April 15th uh, in 1989 and then her departure in early May uh, to prepare to give birth to her first child in Hong Kong. So she, had to, she skipped town pretty early. Uh, so we're going to start. Uh, with, um, is this working? Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, I wanted to say, make three points, basically. One, I'll start with the image, which is since you brought in the personal, uh, the image is connected to my first point, which is that I think it's impossible to overstate the kind of idealism and patriotism of that moment in, on the streets of, in Beijing in 1989. And, um, you know, it was just, it was a moment when even you know after the Communist Party or after Zhao Xiang, I guess, allowed the Chinese newspapers to even cover what was happening on the streets with very sympathetic coverage. Even the kind of grannies of Beijing and the old people and people who had been afraid to sort of speak out and you know say anything or whatever because they've been through many a uh, hundred flowers blooming and you know greatly forward and cultural revolution all these things that they. There was a moment when they kind of abandoned their disbelief and and felt like, oh my God, maybe China will change. And so my personal sort of image, which I just thought of the second, was being I was eight and a half months pregnant and I was you know walking with the students covering it from you know Beijing University to Tiananmen and waddling. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> um, and I remember people kind of saying, oh my God, protect her, protect her, and sort of trying to make room for me. And literally, Granny's throwing me bags of plastic triangular bags of milk to say, you know, take care of her. And, you know, and people saying, please go tell our story to the world. And so that's my little sort of image, a very, very personal one. I think anybody who was in, in China at that time, you know, our lives were all permanently changed by that experience, just, just you know, living through it. But um, the other thing, the, the other two points I wanted to make that I think are sometimes forgotten is, and this is, I'm bringing into this the context of having, what I, I was there, Adi, my husband, and I were there from 87 to 1990. And so we were covering the sort of build-up and the intellectual ferment and, and exciting, incredibly exciting intellectual exploration that was going on in 87 and 88 leading up to that. And um, I was, what I want to say is that it was, the part that I think is forgotten often is that it was a power struggle. And that this was not so much about the students on the street as it was about a power struggle within the inner sanctum of the Communist Party. And I can say that, you know, with confidence because I was spending a lot of time with people like Su Shaozhi, who was the head of the Marxism Leninism Institute in Beijing, and Yan Jiati, who was the head of the uh, Politics Institute in Beijing. And you know, we, we would sort of tiptoe around and try to go to see them, and they would say, "You have to understand, this is a very, very dangerous moment right now in China. We are." These were people who were kind of doing research for Zhao Ziyang and for the liberals within the party. And, um, you know, they were doing it at great risk. They, they were doing, studying the West, studying Western liberal democracies and liberal systems and trying to figure out what to do. The head of the Marxism Leninism Institute, for God's sake, he was trying to sort of make rationale and, and explain Marxism in the context of globalism and democracy and those kinds of things. So it was definitely a power struggle and I think that that's, you know, it was between the old guard revolutionaries and I'll never forget the quote from Hu Chiaohu, um, Mao's old secretary, who allegedly said, if we give the students an inch, we will lose the country. And that was really what the old guard believed at the time. Um, and then my last point, I'm sorry I'm taking so much time, but is that it was a real turn, my view is that that it was a real turning point for China. But not so much the turning point, like the Communist Party will often say, oh my gosh, if we hadn't cracked down on the students, we wouldn't have the prosperity of China today because that allowed us to move forward and grow, et cetera. I would argue that it was a turning point in the sense that if that hadn't happened, 
And when Deng Xiaoping went down south in 1992 and called on everybody to basically go out and get rich, the fact that it led to the distortions that you see in China's society today, the corruption that you see, that it's a society that's obsessed with money, and because they never have been able to develop the kind of software um, and uh, the sort of kinds of, of cultural and political reforms that would have been required to kind of, you know, come to a, a healthier society today. Mm -hmm. And I think that I'll, I assume that I'll be taken up in some of the panels today. Right? So, well. so we're going to now go to Adi, um, who was covering uh, China for the Wall Street Journal, um, and who had to leave Beijing uh, a few weeks after Dinda uh, to be there when the sun was born. And I guess he left two days after martial yeah, law was declared? His due date was due to court, but he was born on May 23rd. So, thank God. Who right, this is a panel of people who were not actually there. <laughs> I do this account as my New York Times. So, so yeah, so we were there. You know, I was, I was one of the first journalists who was covering you know, this the, that first overnight student movement. I mean, I can remember it every day of the week, and it's probably obscure to most of you. But you know, Huyang Bang guys, students in Beijing come together. You know, to this day, it seems clear it was unplanned, it was spontaneous. But it was important. Uh, you know, they, they ended up at the Xi'an Gate outside where the party is, and you know the later accounts of that that they were besieging the Xi'an Gate. You know, the party was described as something very broad, very dangerous. Uh, uh, it was nothing of the kind. And what struck me, uh, you know, what I was there reporting was the discipline of the students. So you will remember there was a moment when somebody threw paint on. Uh, the portrait of Mao um, at Tennessee Square. It was students who, you know, captured the person and basically allowed for that person to be turned over to the police. I mean, it was, it was, you know, it wasn't hundred percent, and you know, you have millions of people on the street. It's not like everything is orderly, but the the commitment of you know people like Wang Dan, student leaders, to make this orderly, to not push beyond the, the demands, which were pretty limited, was it was very interesting, and so. All this is interesting, not so much our memories, but the questions that come up now. So yesterday at Harvard, there was a, a June 4th commemoration uh, that I was at. Wang Gan was there, Hao Jian, an activist, and some others. And it was packed. There were probably 200 Chinese students, uh, and most students at Harvard or elsewhere in Boston. Just really trying to know, nobody wanted to leave. It was, it was, but the questions were, they, they weren't, Propagandists for the government. They were legitimately confused, asking questions. I mean, really, what did it just alluded to? Um, it was chaos. Every every government puts down chaos. And so the only perspective that I want to give to this is the student movement initially was limited. Uh, the demands were limited, and the government had an opportunity. As Wang Dan said yesterday, there was discontent. There was discontent on the universities before Huya Bang died. It was going to come out somehow. It came out in this way, and students took to the street. It was going to come out. The government was going to have a moment when they would have to respond to that. And you know, in my view, the government failed to test. The publication, it seems all clear to American ears, the publication of an official editorial of the People's Daily on April 26 changed everything. And we can talk about the politics of that, the worst luck in the world, Zhao Ziyang had pre-planned trip to North Korea, which he went ahead and did. His voice was not there. Explain what that editorial was. So the editorial basically branded the movement as, you know, anti-patriotic, anti-party, anti-socialist. And, you know, again, that sounds like just words. In China then, I'd say more than today, but in China then, a people's daily editorial is, you know, the law. And, you know, by the end of it, the students' demands were limited. They wanted dialogue over university affairs. They wanted the government to rescind the, uh, the branding of their movement as unpatriotic. Those two things, students, I believe, there's no way to know this, but I believe the students would have gone back to campus and bloodshed would have been averted. You know, the student movement was also for reform, which picks up what we just said. It was anti-corruption. It was people frustrated by the slowing of, of reform. Replacing Huya Bang. You know, in my mind, if the government had, had found the ability to co opt the movement, to 
you know, to, to, to find a way to meet those two fairly moderate demands for a you know, distance, we can say that, um, you would have had an accelerated reform, China would have taken off sooner, possibly with, with less corruption than it had. But the logic, the Du Chamu logic, if we give an inch, all was lost, really, at the sense of face. You know, Li Peng came out publicly and made it clear that Deng Xiaoping had decided that we had to take a tough stance against the students. That pissed off Deng against all the Deng Xiaoping memoirs. That pissed off Deng. His face was on the line, and so sort of these kind of rational solutions were, were sort of off the table. But, um, you know, the movement, as Dina said, it was peaceful, it was, it was idealistic, it was patriotic, and the bloodshed, in my mind, was unnecessary. I wonder if you guys could just say a little bit more about how you, you what kind of visibility you have into how the government is reacting to events that have been taking place, and, and just sort of from a, how do you do your job on a daily basis kind of by the level? You know, were you sort of toggling between going out into the square and reporting and talking to government officials? Do you have any sources in the military? Like, would you, were there any, was, were there things that gave you sort of an inkling of how this <coughs> And that we're done from. So I would, I would just happily jump in with just one quick thing and then he can to speak. But I would say that once the student movement happened, that, uh, you know, it was very confusing and it was virtually impossible. You know, at that point, the sort of power struggle narrative was inaccessible. You know, we just didn't have an access to that. that that's, that's my personal experience. And I certainly didn't have any military support. Maybe other people did. Just, it was really hard to report it. You know, it was going on. I remember on the same day the New York Times reported that this student movement has no leaders. The same day that I reported the Wall Street Journal, uh, I had you know, straight to dinner with Gord I see. Yeah, you know, there, there's some people who are emerging as, as uh, respected leaders. Look, there he is right there. Um, you know, when, when, when the party of, you know, allowed reporting essentially told people to get out there on the streets, and that was the job of the young fashion. You know, at that point, we had sources who could tell us that that was happening. You know, that we were more likely to have sources in the Zhao, you know, Baotong, relatively liberal in terms of economic and political reforms camp than we would in the Li Peng, Li Chao camp. So we had well, there was a funny moment, though, when, you know, after the military had been called forth, and they stopped, remember? They were in that, they were kind of encircling Beijing, and they were basically stopped by people who were living. Um, and later, I think the leadership had to call in more distant troops who were less aware of what was happening in the capital in order to induce them to act. But um, so there were those funny moments where you actually could talk to soldiers because they were stuck in villages with their armored personnel there and they were surrounded by, you know, Chinese peasants who were saying, Don't you dare go shoot at the students that they did. So there was some funny. Uh, I'm sorry, a brief commercial. Everybody's asking us about how to get online in this room. Wi Fi. Wi Fi. So you, you go, go to the hub quarters and you can render your name, make up the room number, it doesn't matter, enter your email, and you'll be, you'll be live. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay. And that gives me a chance to introduce Carol Booker. Oh, sure. uh, also run for uh, Newsweek and who came in following Gorbachev. Yes? Yes, I was actually, I lived in Beijing from 1985 to and then I was in the Moscow Bureau. So I did see it very much through, I mean, the Soviet Union was collapsing at the same time, let's not forget, like 1989 was the banner year for um, foreign news coverage, sort of a high watermark for those of us who were foreign correspondents. And the students were, to some extent, I don't mean to overplay this, it was essentially a, a native phenomenon, but they were aware that Gorbachev was coming, they did want to be on the square, they were holding signs saying, we want Glasgow's too, and they were trying to send a message to their own leadership about uh, what they saw Gorbachev was doing right, that the Chinese Communist Party had just thought they could do it. And I think, if, you know, if you ask about a memory or an image, it really, I just want to call forth for everybody, just for a moment, for those of you who were there, the feeling of utter joy that we had. And the extraordinary feeling that China was really speaking for the first time. I remember Tiananmen always as this torrent of words. If you were a journalist, sometimes it's very hard to get Chinese people to talk to you what they thought about politics. And suddenly, 
everybody we talked to about that they thought about politics. And there were signs everywhere. We were all furiously writing and dispatching and covering. And people were, people could not stop talking. It was this explosion, this torrent of talk. And it was very exciting. And, and, and because it was so joyous, that's why the tech now was so emotional also for us all. And I, I have this. You know, it's terrible to like have a hotel or a former first time hotel memory. You know, former first time always call me taxi driver. It's awful, but I'm on deadline in the Denver hotel, and the guy comes with the room service, and I have to you know, and there's that you know the little um, leather folder thing the bill is in. So he gives it to me so I can sign my name, and in ink. On the inside cover of that leather folder thing, he had written in English, thank you. Uh -huh. And when I opened the folder and I saw it, I, I looked up and my eyes met his eyes and we couldn't talk. The torrent of words had ended and we both knew that I was the, the room was blocked. But he, I knew what he was saying. Saying thank you for writing what you're writing right now and keep up the, keep up the message and the talk to the outside world. It was a very, um, you know, I, I mean, I went on to like a career in human rights advocacy, so it was a very defining moment for me. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. So, Bruce. Uh, had been had spent time in Hong Kong as a student and uh, and was in New York working for CNN and uh, sort of went around his boss uh, to get assigned to go to Beijing in, uh, in, May, in late May. Yeah. Um, quick, first of all, thank you very much, uh, DOC Press Club, for being such a guest company. It's wonderful. I live in Colorado and. I try and explain some of my experiences to people there, and I get blank stares unless they're Asians or involved in history. So this is really kind of it's an emotional thing as well. Quick story: I was a Chinese history major in college, studied Mandarin, was a student at Chinese University of Hong Kong, worked for British television Reuters TV for several years, went over to CNN, and I'd only been there for eight months when all of this began to happen, and I was going crazy at the New York bureau here at Five Ben Plaza. And I called down to Atlanta, the international desk, and I said, you don't know me, but, you know, here's my background, and I know the story, and, you know, basically kind of just pitched them, and like, okay, fax us your resume, remember faxing? Fax us your resume. And about an hour later, I'm in a video editing booth working as a producer, editing something of the demonstrations, the pro-democracy demonstrations here, and my bureau chief comes to me, like, what the hell have you been doing? I just got a call from Atlanta. They want you on a plane to Beijing tonight. I want an explanation. So I called my wife, who was a county man. She screamed. And 36 hours later, I was in the square. I arrived about two and a half weeks before the crackdown and ended up staying for about another week and a half after, until it became untenable for journalists. Um, in terms of a memory... That's when we came back from Hong Kong. <laughs> probably passed you in the airport. In terms of memory, I was in the square um, the night of June 4th onwards, and I have a bunch of very vivid memories. Um, watching uh, tracer bullets go overhead, having wounded students being carried into the square by medical university students into the makeshift tent there. Um, watching the armored personnel carry that the students stopped and burned with Molotov cocktails in the front. Um, but I was saying, it was. Are, are there any film buffs here? interested in movies with another an obscure reference, I apologize. At one point, there was just such this trauma going on, shooting and wounded people and all this, and then on the eastern side of the square, which is the uh, Museum of the Revolution, I believe, there was a double line of PLA soldiers running in place with bayonets fixed. And I just remember thinking, oh my god, the Odessa steps. The, the movie, 1929 movie, Battleship Potemkin, silent film, which commemorated the 1905 rebellion of a Russian Tsar's battleship. It comes into Odessa Harbor. It's a big Soviet propaganda movie. The, the, the people of Odessa come down these waterfront steps to cheer them on, and they're all shot down by Tsar's troops. And it's a very famous sequence. There's a, 
a baby pram bouncing down the stairs and all that. But I'm a film buff, and honestly, that's what I thought. The Odessa steps were all going to be bloody. And I tried to get my film crew um, out of there. Um, the lady who's involved right now, Cindy Strand, is the head of international news at CNN. Kit Schwartz, I'm not sure what he's doing. But they were based there in Beijing, and they're like, no, we can't leave. There's still a story going on. I go, you don't understand. We're about to get shot. We're about to get banned. We need to go. And they refused. So I took their tapes and ran. And ran down the side street in the darkness. And ran to the Beijing Hotel, which is our forward base. But a woman came out and said, don't come in here. They're arresting foreigners and stealing and taking their things. So I ran through a construction site in front of the Beijing Hotel there and came out the other side. And I stopped a man on a motorcycle. And I gave, I said, you know, I'll give you money if you take me to the Chongtung Fundy, the, uh, the Sheridan Great Wall Hotel, which is five or six miles from downtown. It's like fine. And so I jumped on the back, put my head down, held onto my tapes, rode through troops arriving into the square, and through all the hutongs with people flushed on the streets. Does anyone here remember the blackout in New York in 78, 79, where there were always like clusters of people on the corners watching what was happening? and the sense of electric tension, that's what it was. It was just dark and tense and fires and just, it's, it's very hallucinogenic to me, very vivid. And I just remember arriving in the downtown into the, in the Great Hall, Sheridan, with the tapes under my arm, I paid this gentleman, I guess the equivalent like two weeks salary at the time, a lot of money. We came in pretending that I was hurt with the tapes clustered on my arm in case there were police there. And there were two of our student interns in the hallway, and they're like, Bruce, they grabbed me. I'm like, are there any cops? No, oh, good, here. And we got upstairs. This is after the Chinese government had closed down all satellite feeds. But CNN had something called a four wire, which allowed broadcast quality audio back and forth. Um, they also had an experimental. It's amazing when you think, you know, now, that this all could have been live streamed from the square. And you could have had Wu or Fei Shi talking live, or Wang Dong or someone. But I mean, also just think about how different the result might have been, how many lives might have been saved, if this was being seen in real time, and how that might have changed the whole sequence of events. What's, what gets me now, it, just, it was like such a struggle to get that information out. And now, you know, as we're doing now, you can live stream this all. Uh, so it really was sort of of that moment, that historic moment, that there was all this information getting out, and I give huge credit, you know, not just to what I was doing, but to the, the Western journalists in general, who really put themselves on the line trying to get this information out, because it was it was scary, and it was a struggle, and I was I was detained by the Lumang Bu several days later for violating martial law with my crew, had my gear confiscated, and had to write a self-confession. I was more worried about the gear being confiscated because it was a $40,000 he got in camera. And I was thinking that's the end of my career. <laughs> but you just think about how different a Tiananmen situation would be now than it is then. So that's my, my brief bit of memory. One thing that um, three of you have highlighted that just resonated with me, so I just have to just jump in my own quick story. It's just the involvement of ordinary people in Beijing and sort of in helping really get the work done and uh, helping move people around in what's an incredibly um, big city. And um, and it just made me think of this very short story. So I, I, I arrived to report on China for Time Magazine in, uh, in 2000 when Tommy hired me. Um, and, uh, this is a cab driver story, so I've never told it before. I had one cab driver who used to take me around quite a bit, and I, after I'd known him for two or three years, I asked him, what's the furthest you've ever driven from Beijing? And he said, oh, well, one time I drove all the way to Tibet. And I said, well, that's a pretty far drive. And I said, when was that? And there was an incredibly long pause, and he said, well, that was at the end of June 1989. And he told me that um, at the time he'd been working for a, he was a truck driver. He worked for a, a company that had a fleet of trucks. And um, and he had driven wounded people off the, off the streets of Beijing to hospitals all night. And he had gotten back to his 
um, the headquarters for his trucking company, and his boss had said, you're fired, get out of here. And so he left town, and when he finally came back to Beijing several months later, um, he found out that all of the truck drivers that worked for this company had all done that, and, uh, and so they actually got their jobs back. But that's just sort of an image for me of, of uh, you know, how much ordinary people in Beijing were involved in these protests. Okay, but I want to get to you. Dory. So Dory was working for Business Week uh, in 1989 uh, and had been in China for several years. Right, yeah, I'm Dory jones -Yan. I came here from Seattle, and I, I appreciate being able to come. I um, have a little bit of a different perspective because I was a business reporter for Business Week, and I had um, I'd studied about China and, and studied Chinese, and I was based in Hong Kong from 1982 to 1990, and so I was a privilege to watch the, the very earliest days of the economic reform and uh, opening up and um, but also of course uh, Tiananmen Square and um, looking back uh, from 30 years uh, kind of gives you a different perspective I've been working on a memoir of those days um, a couple of I I uh, agree completely with Tara uh, some of her comments that it was so in mid-May it was so exciting and before that it was very very hard to get Chinese people to talk to a foreign reporter and um, people were so open and going onto the square and getting people to talk to me um, just openly about politics telling me what they thought of Deng Xiaoping and what they thought of Hong Kong and after so many years of people being uh, afraid to say their opinion and it was just so full of hope I mean it was anarchy um, in the best sense, um, it was there was no rule of law. There were ordinary citizens directing traffic, even, but it was it was a sense of, of total excitement and joy and optimism. And um, although I also got people saying thank you, thank you so much for for telling our story. And then, um, in, in contrast to. Um, I would, had actually returned to Hong Kong. It looked like things were coming down. And then the night of June 4th, I got a call from my editors in New York saying, uh, can you get up there on June 4th? So I flew in that day. And Carol's story reminded me when uh, when we were flying, there weren't too many people on the plane going from Hong Kong to Beijing that day. <laughs> there was a TV crew and me, and that was about it. But we were, just as we were about to, well, they landed in Tianjin because they didn't know what was going to be the situation. The pilot didn't know what the situation was going to be in Beijing. So, uh, and they somehow managed to uh, project the evening news, the Chinese uh, CCTV evening news, on the airplane so we could all see it at the same time. And of course it was in Chinese. My Chinese was pretty good, but I listened and it said how many soldiers were killed, and, it, and I didn't hear anything about how many civilians were killed, so I I went to the flight attendant and said, I'm sorry, I didn't really understand. How many how many civilians were killed? And she said, do you think they're going to tell us that? <laughs> <laughs> and she was also, I mean, she had been in Hong Kong, and uh, many of the people knew, well, everybody knew what was going on. And then I got a, um, a taxi driver to drive me all the way around the city of Beijing the next day, and it was just so shocking to see a city that's, that's so familiar to me, almost mundane, I've been there so many times, that it turned into a war zone. And there were uh, burnout buses and overturned trucks and twisted metal uh, traffic barriers all over and, and bullet holes in the streets. And um, it was, uh, there were still snipers that they didn't know at the time, but there were some that were taking pot shots. My cab driver had tinted windows and said, you know, get down in the back. Uh, it, it, well, as soon as I tell you, you need to put your head down. Because he wasn't supposed to be taking me around, and then he uh, he took me right up to the edge of the square, and all the uh, the tanks were pointing out at that point, and uh, then he took me up to the university district, uh, which the, the troops had not gotten there yet, and there were um, hand uh, handwritten banners, and one of them one of them said, uh, "Blood has drenched China. Brutality has reached its extreme," and um, it was uh, for anybody who would experienced all that joy, it was uh, it was a huge shock. And so in, in your case, that made you leave China? 
Yes, Tiananmen Square changed my life. Um, I was so disheartened and disillusioned afterwards. I had been so, so thrilled and excited every single year that I was there before China was more and more open. And the private, as a business reporter reporting about the private sector, and it was more and more open and US China trade and investment. And it just, it felt like that was it. It was over. China was gonna shut up tight and go back to the old ways of political campaigns. And, and so I, I got back and talked to my editor in chief and he said, well, what's next for you? And I said, I'd like to transfer back. And so within about a year, I, uh, I was transferred back. And uh, I visited China many, many times since then, but I haven't reported about it. But it was, uh, yeah, definitely changed my life. So by the end of you, you came back, you spent some time in Russia and you came back to China to kind of cover the, what the times they are really the boom years of the, of the, of the boom years for, for China Magazine and for these Week and Asia Week. And I just wonder, do you have a sense for kind of what the, just emotionally and analytically, how covering Tiananmen shaped your understanding of, of what came next? Um, so I, I shared, I mean, really, Dory's emotions. I mean, we were, it was joyous, we were optimistic, probably naively optimistic that once there were a million people on the street, it was going to happen somehow. Um, we all wanted that. I mean, my perspective is a little bit different from Bruce's. I mean, you're right, it would be very different if this were today and people could live stream. Tiananmen was different because uh, it was the first time, this is working. Was, oh, that's yeah, right. Better. Okay. Um, you know, Tiananmen to me was different because it was almost, it was close to real time. You know, Mike Chinoy standing on Tiananmen Square before they you know, finally cut off the live feed. I think, I think we experienced that moment almost real time. The world did, almost real time. Than that. Less than we could now, but more than that. So, I don't know. So, so journalists were there, maybe foreigners were there. We call ourselves the class of 89. Um, it's not a compliment, I think. Yeah, we did. Yeah, I'm calling, I'm calling Carol Classic in right now. Um, and I think I, I think I honestly miss the, you know, the the economic, the, the economic development as it started to happen because I was so disillusioned because I believed all the people who said the party's going to fall within six months, within one year, within two years, it's untenable. The people will put up with it, and I, to be honest, that was a, a distraction and obviously not even remotely true. So it kind of took a while to. Remember, this is complicated. You know, I, I mean, in my view, reform would have happened sooner rather than later. I, I don't credit crackdown with the economic development. It doesn't make sense to me. But if you believe that the party gives the answers all over, then okay, then, then you know that had to happen. But uh, you know, it, it took a while. Now China is undeniably more prosperous, more successful on a global scale. You know, at what price? And I think the deal that. Don't tell things sort of play out, and you can get rich, and you keep your mouth shut, and there will be people in prison, there will be bloodshed if you cross a whole lot of sort of red lines. That was laid out in 89, and that's kind of still trying to say. Yeah, I guess I would add that. I mean, I think there's no question that, um, you know, we spent a year after Canada and after June 4th in Beijing. That was a very weird and, you know, terrible year, of course. Um, it was very, you know, much worse for the Chinese who felt like they had to, you know, live through that experience. We we just basically didn't see any of our Chinese friends or any of our sources because we knew that if we, you know, the minute we went out of our compound, we were followed by two motorcycles who didn't try to hide themselves. They wanted to be following us, and that was very effective because it really cut us off from all of our sources and friends who just didn't see anybody. So, I remember. It was very, very hard. It was very hard to do any journalism that year. Um, but, um, you know, I would say in, in, it's hard for me to look at China without looking through today, without looking through that prism. It definitely changed the way I see China. I, but I would be so bold as to say that those of us who kind of lived through that, I think we're sort of the truth seers in China about what's happening in China today. Because, yes, there's incredible excitement and dynamism and innovation and, you know, cool art and cool fashion. All that stuff is happening. Technology. 
Um, and that's all a wonderful thing that should be celebrated and it's really great. But as I said at the beginning, there are tremendous and terrible distortions to Chinese in Chinese society today and terrible corruption that's endemic, the system systemic. And those things I think really are there was a turning point. And let's not forget that Jazian spent the rest of his life under house arrest. And he saw a different path for this country. And it doesn't mean that he didn't wouldn't have modernized and gone the path of economic reform. So he's the one who started it out in the countryside for God's sake. He believed absolutely in economic reform and he also he talked about something that he called Chawin Ni, you know, sort of over stability, that, that would lead to a brit a brittleness in Chinese society. And that I think he was very prescient actually in, in, in seeing that in his advisors, et cetera. So you know, it definitely has colored the way I see China, and sometimes I feel like I wish I could sort of, you know, get over it. Like, get over it. Look at what, how exciting China is today. But I can't get over it, and I think that actually that means that I'm seeing the country in a realer way. Yes. I, I also think that it had a little bit of an effect on um, the way correspondents cover the Soviet Union. Because I mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. The whole Moscow press corner. The whole foreign press corps that covered the Soviet Union was there and was very aware. Most of them didn't really know anything about China and they didn't stay as long as I did, but they knew about the crackdown. And I remember writing this very apocalyptic piece for Newsweek that, you know, Gord, don't believe Gorbachev, this is what Doug Chuck H just did. You know, it was a communist report and very sticky. I think it may have contributed, to be honest, not in a good way, to uh, an excess of skepticism about Gorbachev, who faced it actually you know, configuration of forces. There were similarities, but we may have already done that. I have a little bit of a different opinion. Um, I, uh, there is absolutely no justification or excusing of uh, killing. Uh, one's citizens in the streets of your capital city whatsoever. But I do think that um, the stability that resulted was good for a lot of people in China. There were a lot of beneficiaries. In fact, pretty much anybody who's lived in China in the last 30 years has in a way benefited from the fact that China was stable during that time. And I think a very fast growth uh, might not have been possible if it hadn't been stable. Now, we don't know, there's two what ifs. There's a what if Jiaoyang had had his, had his way, but there's also the what if uh, uh, in terms of if the Communist Party had fallen, and we do know what happened in the Soviet Union. Is that what you mean by unstable? I mean, if the party had, I mean, I'm curious, because it, it's such a, stability is such a charged term because of the way that Right. The Chinese government uses the word stability um, in one way. And I would say that we in America um, don't really understand instability the way the Chinese do because in the last hundred years they've had invasion and uh, warlords and their, their weak government and their country falling apart and, and horrible uh, political campaigns. And in our lifetime, we're fortunate in America that we haven't had that kind of instability. So when I say stability, I just mean that no horrible things are happening in terms of in, in those terms. And it's very hard to have fast economic growth in places like Syria and Libya and certainly Russia in the 90s. Um, super instability um, is, is not conducive to economic growth. I have to respond. I really knew I was going to. I have to respond and just say that I don't think it was ever either or. You know, there was nobody in China who wanted one and chaos and the jobs down camp, the reformers who were promoting, you know, more openness. In fact, they would have argued that a freer press or that certain, you know, different ways of, of moving that society could have led to greater stability but it wasn't as brittle. That you know, um, that and I, I don't think anybody was really talking about the fall of the Communist Party. It was only like the old guard guys like Hu Chiangmu who said, "Oh my God, if we lose an inch, we'll lose the country." But that's not what Chiang Kai wanted. That's not what those the reformers wanted at all. So I, I would I would have to you know push back on that. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I went back. I went back in '99 to the 50th anniversary. 
from the PRC when I became a senior producer at CNN.com, which when it was still rather experimental. And I blogged before blogging was cool. I traveled back between Beijing and Shanghai talking to people. And I just remember being in Beijing with a bunch of journalists based there at this beautiful Irish bar. It's like somebody had taken an Irish tavern and sat down in Beijing. And you know, there were younger men and women. And they go, oh, you, you 89 guys, your perspective is so weird. You know, it's, it's you know, and, and I felt it's like, well, you don't understand. I mean, we've seen the government as worse here. And this whole sense of it, I, I do think that there's sort of this seduction that the money has brought to, you know, you're saying, it's like the devil's pattern was made with the government. Be quiet, don't talk about politics, we'll take care of your well-being. And, you know, Give, give the country credit, they brought 250 million people above the poverty line in 10 years after 1989. That's huge. But there's this incredible amnesia. And as you know, if you've ever spoken to anyone under the age of 30 in China, Tiananmen, you know, June 4th, it's, it's, it's like this huge gap in, in, in the history of the country. And it just it's very odd. And, you know, there have been efforts by people like Rose Tong and, um, you know, some of these dissident groups that have happened here to get out the word to people. But I wonder how much of that is actually getting back into the country. Because <laughs> why it's fascinating when you said you talk to students at Harvard, if you've got any pushback from people, um, and the students saying this is all propaganda by the West, right? because I, you know, I, I, I feel very isolated out in the middle of the country. I have no real sense of this. But it's, I just have this feeling that it's like, you know, <laughs> Part of my family is German Jewish, and it's like you, you talk to Germans about World War II, and it's like, you know, 1939, and then in 1945, and this is gap. And it feels that way with China. Like there's this forbidden part of the history that can't be discussed. And, and that's intriguing to me. I'm wondering when that would change, if it would change. Just to follow up on some of the questions that Chinese students were asking, you know, one student got up and said, um, it was actually very interesting. This said a lot about China, so that all the participants were were named or being filmed. It was all uh, you know the public record. But they made it clear that any anyone who asked a question should not identify themselves. That in the transcript, in any recording, they would not be identified. So there is a sense that this is a taboo topic, even in the United States of America, for Chinese to talk about. Um, one of the questions was uh, President Johnson spoke out and said, "No one died." I, I think he probably said on Tiananmen Square, but it was sort of, you know, even that seemed to be an obfuscation, but it, but kind of repeating you know, the president's words about the you know, sort of lack of, of, of bloodshed and, and uh, you know, and the answer that came from the floor was president, yes, we've learned in our experience, presidents sometimes lie. Um, the, you know, other questions were sort of, you know, the, the Dory uh, uh, set up that, well, Governments crack down on rats. That you know, you have to. Anyone would do that. And um, I think the lack of transparency and the, the lack of memory makes it hard. I mean, the sort of nuance that, that we tried to respond to this wasn't an either or. This wasn't you know the demands were relatively minor, and the government could have co-opted them or responded to them. You know, that's lost. There's a sense of there was unrest on the street. It was stirred up. It was premeditated. It was stirred up by you know, a, a relatively small group of people who wanted the overthrow of the Communist Party, and that's what people hear. That sounds really bad. That sounds like the type of thing you crack down on. So I think you know, in 200 students at a time, I mean, at least they have a, another perspective on what happened in 1989, and maybe you know, it trickles back little by little. Oh, there's there's so much expertise on this in the room. Oh, did you want to sit on my hand? Let's go. What? You got to be trying to wrap it. You, 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 no, no, I just think it's so interesting what Adi just said about the Harvard thing and how he didn't ask people to identify themselves. And I'm just wondering really how much protection does that give them? Uh, I mean, yeah, it's zero, right? So I just, I have also this memory. I was giving a talk at a college in the Midwest, a nice liberal arts college with tons of Chinese students because they pay. It's actually a big lifeline for a college like that. And it was about many things, but I touched on Tim on the talk. And afterwards, you know, there are hundreds of people in the room, and people, you know, people stay afterwards to ask me a question or whatever. And there was a woman, young woman at the end of the line, and she just held back. She held back until the projectionist had left. Until she and I were the only two people in this big hall. And she was Chinese, and she said, Okay, now tell me what happened in Tim. 
I can't ask in front of anybody else. I couldn't ask them the questions and answers because I'm not free here in this in the world of the Midwest of the United States to ask that question. And that is to me the most chilling, <laughs> the most chilling inherited or legacy of Channel One is that in the United States, in this country, people don't feel free to ask and speak about. And that I don't think we foresaw in the engineering time. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I'm sure. So if you could just raise your hand and then. Yes. Proceed over here, Gary. <coughs> We're confronting today, in a way, the same issue that was confronting people in 89. Uh, what does change of the government of power mean? Does it mean regime change? What does regime change mean? Just an ouster of a repressive group within the party and the participation and power of a more liberal group? I wanted to hear the panel say something about who yelled on. After all, it was his death that started the whole thing. And when we contemplate the future, who will replace the great leader today? The, Movie Death of Stalin does not tell us. <laughs> so I'd like to hear are we talking? There are people in Washington who want to get rid of the whole Communist Party and the current debate over business, trade, and economics is a lever that might open it up the way they think Reagan opened up the Soviet Union. Is that realistic? Or should we hope for? bringing back more liberal party leaders who might have been. We don't know the contingencies of history. What do we want? What should we wish for? That's a question. I can't answer that question, but, but I do think that that um, framing of the sort of, you know, we want the downfall of the Communist Party, which is not, no, but I, I know that's not what you're saying, Jim, but the, you know, maybe coming out of Washington, is exactly the kind of black and white framing that gets us in trouble when it's like, well, if they hadn't cracked down, and, you know, we wouldn't have made a you know. Um, it's no. I mean, I think that to sort of want the full collapse of the Communist Party is, at first, it's ridiculous. It's just not realistic. And so, you know, of course, I think, I think one should be hoping that you know the reform-minded economists who are working in the government and and more sort of liberal thinkers there will have more of a voice. But I, I'm not sure if we will see that. But and just one other thought is one of the things that makes me saddest about that like, when we're talking about memory, mem the, the erased memory of, of June 4th is not so much the day of June. I mean, we all remember it, and even the Communist Party remembers it and calls it with, you know, black hands and the counter-revolutionary movement. But it's all those great intellectuals of the, of the June 4th kind of era. You know, who remembers today the Fong Jurors? Who remembers Su Xiaojie? Who remembers Liu Yan? Who remembers Yan Zhaxi? I mean, those are some of the greatest thinkers in contemporary China, and they've been completely written out of history books. And that makes me very, very sad <coughs> for China. I wish I had the answer to that. Obviously, none of us really have the, the right answer for it. But I, one perspective that I think is kind of interesting at the time in the 80s, people were talking about well, their political reforms in addition to economic reforms. And I think one of the things that Deng Xiaoping has not been given enough credit for is that he did, he didn't call them particularly political reforms, and they didn't look like our democracy. But the fact that he uh, made sure that there were term limits for the highest uh, leaders in the land, and that after 10 years, there would be a peaceful transition of power in 4,000 years of Chinese history, that's a very rare thing. And it happened twice since then, which was able to be undone in just a very short amount of time by Xi Jinping. So I was very optimistic uh, as China grew, and many of the Individuals that I knew in China who were not intellectuals, but just ordinary people, just had opportunities. It wasn't just money. It was the opportunity to have a better life and to take control of your life. And 
uh, some of my husband's relatives were among them, and we saw them over the years. And uh, I was very optimistic until last year. And when those, it was really when those term limits were, uh, when he was able in a very short amount of time to get a permission for that, it's very hard to see anything positive in the near-term future. And also, it's been 30 years of very fast economic growth. If you look at Taiwan and Korea, they had their fastest economic growth under authoritarian governments. And so maybe 30 years ago, China wasn't ready for what we think of as a democracy, but perhaps today China would be ready, but that's all been stopped in its tracks. We squeeze in a couple of questions. So what was Xi Jinping during Tiananmen? And did it have an impact on, on his thinking? Did it shape? He said Gorbachev was the man enough to stop the protesters in the streets in Moscow. So was Xi Jinping was he shaped by the Tiananmen experience? Did he was he traumatized by that? Um, I think uh, somebody stated before, I guess we were asked, you know, what, what kind of reporting you may be able to do inside the Chinese leadership. And, you know, let's just be honest about how incredibly little we know. Just unbelievably little we know. And, you know, hats off to Andy for, you know, there are some. <laughs> yeah. We know a lot more behind the scenes than we would, otherwise, we knew so precious little at the time. And I, I just think Tiananmen, like the Soviet Union at the time, is this really this fascinating interplay between the strength of the street, what it means to have millions of people on the street demonstrating, and then the extremely, increasingly tight shrink wrap coterie around the leaders who make the decisions, who at that time of crisis become less and less open to hearing lots of different opinions. And, you know, like, uh, I don't mention Zhao Ziyang going to North Korea, like the faithful absence of Zhao Ziyang, and how really small, you know, I always thought so much of understanding the trouble was understanding Raisa, because that was his closest confidant. And when you really, when you're the leader of the country, you have to make an incredibly important decision, like whether you have to shoot your people, you're making an action in such a small group, and that's in such contrast to the vastness of the demonstrations that are taking place. So there's a, there's a funny width and narrowness at the same time in moments of crisis, and their interplay is, is almost unpredictable and un unknowable by us because we know so little about the small. And one last question here. Last question. Uh, to sort of relate one comment, one question to it. Um, I was in Hunan in uh, Haiti in 89, and then back again in 95 and 97. And when I was there in 89, if I had one Chinese person in the room with me, we could talk politics, we could talk about anything. Two Chinese people in the room, not at all. And when I went back in 97, it was a boat trip on to see the Three Gorges. And um, strangers, people who didn't know each other and didn't know me. And some of them were low-level political functionaries and would speak about uh, politics very openly, extremely openly. But the other the thing that was really what brought me here is the phenomenon that I noticed was that when when you talk about earlier political movements, 100 followers thing, and, and all, they get people to talk, and then they tell them to turn in however many it was, 15%, I can't remember. But I was told that after the demonstrations were so widespread in Hunan, in all the rest of the country, that when the government came to them afterwards and asked them to turn in the 15% or whatever it was, that they refused to do it and they got away with it. And I was wondering if anybody knows that that sort of thing also in Beijing, or was it different there because of the uh, more obvious, widespread, uh, big deal thing from the government's point of view? I mean, it's kind of unrelated. Well, after after the crackdown, it got to a point where it was obvious that the crews that had been brought in by CNN to cover the event were not going to be able to be being arrested and detained. And I had on my private camera, I shot like three rolls of film. And I just remember going through customs on the way out with these rolls of film. And the security person stopping me, going through my bag and pulling in and out, going, what are these? 
they won't be filmed. And there was this pause, and she went, okay, go. And so, I mean, I think there was a general, like you were saying, a general feeling of people like, okay, let's let the word get out. Even among the officials, the low-level officials. Certainly among the law by shame, but it's just the sense that the word needs to go out. So, I mean, as, as journalists, I was incredibly appreciative of that. And we kept running into that. People who would look out for you, especially on that night, I mean, it was crazy. So, I don't know if that answers your question. And I, I, mean, I think it's worth mentioning the Tiananmen mothers right now, who mm -hmm. sort of defy all what we think we know about the limits of courage um, that you know, this group of mothers of people who were killed that night um, have met. They do. One of the people on the panel last night was Hao Jian, who's another activist who has hosted uh, Jiu War memorials um, over the years privately. But he, you know, yesterday at Harvard, he, he spoke publicly for the first time uh, about his feelings, about his experiences. His own cousin was, was, was killed that night. So, you know, the, the mothers, in addition to expressing kind of their grief and the national grief, you know, have. have and try to chronicle what happened that night, how many people died, where did they die. You know, with facts like three people were actually shot and killed on Tiananmen Square, as if that matters, as if that distinction matters, but since the government put it forth, they actually have an answer exactly where these people uh, died and how. So, you know, there are some extraordinary examples of, I guess, courage that the Bible we might be capable of ourselves. Okay. Just one more thing. Hi, I'm Nikki Warden. I'm on the Overseas Press Club Board of Governors, and I want to thank the panel for setting the stage so um, thoroughly for the rest of our um, conference today. And I wanted to circle back to something Bruce said about uh, amnesia. And uh, I think we need, uh, for the rest of the day, to grapple with amnesia versus censorship. It's not amnesia. A lot of people remember, but they're not able to talk about it. And I also teach at Columbia University. I have students who every year, graduate students, I have to explain to them what happened in 1989. And I think it's a real responsibility. We have a responsibility, those who, who know what happened, to share it and not to forget it. Um, but I also think that, the, I want to ask you to talk about the lessons of 89. What lessons did the Chinese government learn in Xi Jinping in particular um, that are being manifested today? the control of information, never letting a protest get out of hand, uh, knowing in advance what people are going to do and stopping them. So how is this, how is what happened in 89 morphed into the dystopian future of artificial intelligence and predictive policing? And invite everyone to stay for the rest of the day where we're going to deal with the topics. <laughs> so that's a good question, it's a hard question. Also, I want to have a chance Question from Jerry Cotton. Thank God for Jerry Cotton. So, this isn't a direct answer, but you know, the, the, the crackdown, it's actually came up at the China Institute event, it didn't organize it a few days ago. But the, um, the crackdown on anything to do with feminism in China right now. Um, you know, is sort of defies sort of simple analysis, but it seems to have something to do with the ability of women around the country to organize. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was the case uh, with the crack on the follow go, which had an amazing ability to organize and organize quickly and effectively. And that might be true with, with feminist groups in China. I mean, you know, the hashtag Me Too can't be, you know, they use me, honey, and two potato, and, you know, some kind of games like that. Um, but I, I, I always think about Tiananmen and think about this is a regime that seems to believe that if you get it all, it's over. You know, it's, there's no way of knowing that. might be true. I mean, that might be an actual lesson to take from the fall of Romania and other countries. And other I don't know. We can, we can speculate. But um, I, I, I personally believe there's probably something in between all or nothing. But um, I think that's one example of just not taking any chances. You need to move. Thank you, Pat. Okay. Yeah. Thanks,